Okay, man. Give it a click over on the other side. All right, man. John chapter 4. Just want to start off with a verse or two here. It says, John chapter 4, verse 22. It says, um, well, 21, or let's go back to 20. And we know that this is the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. And she says, uh, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus, sa Jesus saith unto her, Woman, Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye, know, ye worship, uh, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we pray that you bless us and as we look into the scriptures and to what we have, you have for us tonight and pray that we learn and, and um, be able to draw closer to thee in all the things that we do. God, we pray a special anointing tonight for spirit-filled preaching and spirit-filled listening and that we all might be, be edified and strengthened and this church may be edified and you, Lord, would get the glory through all these things. We thank you, Lord, and we do love you. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name for his sake. Amen. Amen. Well, what I want to talk to you just for a few minutes today is about uh, May Day. Uh, this is, uh, seems a bit, uh, um, you know, um, uh, in, I uh, uh, can't think of the word, in, uh, the word is just completely gone, it's right there, I can see it, but uh, innocuous, no, it's not the word I was looking for, uh, maybe it is. Anyway, but uh, May Day is today, it's the 1st of May, and what, something I didn't realize until I was looking at this is a lot of pagans actually start their days the night before. They kind of copy what God did. So a lot of times they start. That's why a lot of things like Halloween starts on the 31st. It doesn't start during the day. It starts about 6 o'clock on Halloween night, proceeding through to the following day. And this is something I didn't know. I mean, I knew Halloween was obviously, I thought it was specifically that day. But they don't, well, obviously they do things later on that night. And obviously, as we know, it progresses into the early hours of November 1st. But November 1st being All Saints Day. But uh, interestingly enough, May Day is the actual opposite. Uh, if you on the on the, the the calendar, the pagan calendar, it's the exact opposite. They're six months apart, and the pagans are big on opposites. You know, one of the biggest things is as above, so below. And uh, which Bible version is is that uses that? Is it the message? The message. I think in the message when it's talking about the Lord's Prayer, it uses the phraseology as above, so below. Not saying you know. Um, you know, as in heaven, uh, you know, thy will be done in earth, so it is in heaven. Uh, not saying that, but obviously that's not the Lord's prayer, that's the model prayer. We're not intended to pray that prayer. Uh, God never commanded us to pray that because it's not a prayer. Jesus said, after this manner, pray. He didn't say, repeat these words. But anyway, that's a, another subject. That's just vain repetitions, just as the heathen do. Um, but uh, we also, we have to be particular about the grammar of the Bible. Uh, and things like that. I'm having a discussion with someone on Facebook today, uh, or the last couple of days actually about that, but it just pertains to simple grammar, uh, not understanding these things. But anyway, we find May Day, the 1st of May, kind of starts on April 30th uh, on that night and progresses through this day. And what is it? What is this day? We all think of May Day, we think, oh, we'll get a bank holiday, all these kind of things. We may think of the Maypole and the Morris Tancers and all these things. But does this have any connection uh, to paganism? You know, some of you shake your heads. Uh, some of you think that that's, that's not it is. But it, what we're going to do is we're going to look in and see exactly where it came from. Because today's May Day Festival is an amalgamation of a lot of different things. Now, we, one thing is clear to me when studying um, on different things. When cultures around the world that have really no recognizable... Um, joining or recognizable connection, if you like, have a holiday on the same day, rings a bell. There's a bell, you know, just uh, it gives an alarm, really. When you see two cultures on the opposite sides of the globe, but their holidays are on the exact same day, you're thinking, why? 
you know, now according to, to the worldly traditions, there should be absolutely no reason for this because they would have all evolved at different times. But as we, we know from the scriptures, we know that um, everybody is or originated from Adam and Eve. And through the Tower of Babel, we see after the Tower of Babel, the nations were scattered. When, and when they were scattered, what did they carry with them? Well, they carried two things. They carried truth and they carried lies. They carried a lot of truth, and them carried truth about what God had done. So they carried stories about creation. They carried stories about the flood. Why? Because these things were not really polluted. You know, although they worshipped other gods, these stories were quite told. And if you look in many civilizations, you will find that there's a creation story and there's a flood story. And pretty much every civilization in the world, even to the Aborigines in Australia, have a creation story and they have a flood story. The Cherokee Indians have a creation story and they have a flood story. All right? Any of these civilizations will have some sort of that. After that, their history seems to be a bit disjointed. Why? Because at this point in time, basically the whole world shared that point in history. It is only at this point then that we started to scatter throughout the whole world. But when we come down and see that on, this, on the pagan calendar, if you like, in the Gregorian calendar, that civilizations are having these holidays on the same day, we have to stop and say, why? Why does Great Britain have Halloween? And Mexico has uh, Dias de Muerte, the Day of the Dead. You know, why are these two civilizations, they've got really nothing in common, but they seem to have a similar holiday on the same day. And we see this throughout Europe. We see all these Europeans, you see, all oh, kind of rooted in these kind of things. But we do see that May Day, the 1st of May, beginning on the, on the, the 30th of April, has a connection throughout a lot of the world. Now, the festivals weren't exactly the same, but here lately they've kind of come together. We do find that the Romans held a ceremony, uh, a, a festival of Floralia, uh, dedicated to the goddess Flora. All right, you've heard of Flora and Fauna. So Flora is the god of flowers. Flowers. Okay, it's that symbol. That's the word. So Floralia. I think that's what um, the Romans just did. If you want to know what the festival was about, just take off the alia and you've got the, the festival. Saturnalia, take it off. Saturn. Floralia, take it off. Flora. It's just that simple. You really didn't uh, come up with anything better than that. Just put alia on the end of it. So if you know somebody that's got a last name, alia, or something like that, you say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. But anyway... We find that uh, the, this half, uh, this divides the year. We've got this Beltane festival or May Day uh, or other things that it's called. And we've got so the festival of Sylvain uh, or Halloween on the opposite side of the year. Now, the festival of Halloween, as we know, celebrates death. It celebrates uh, dying. It celebrates, uh, you know, the, 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 the time where they think that the veil between the spirit world and the real world is very thin and they can pass freely through. Uh, they believe that it's a day of, of um, remembering the dead in, in Mexico and all these things. And the opposite is true of May Day. Although they still believe that the spirit, the spirit world is very close at this time again, they believe it's a celebration of life, a rebirth, uh, not a rebirth of the sun, but uh, a celebration of the, of the sun coming back. Obviously, they believe that the sun is reborn on the 21st or 20, between the 21st and 25th day of December. Uh, hence why Christmas is there. So, but uh, we do find that the Romans uh, did this, and a lot of times they would have the bonfires uh, and do these things, and the fire is always a, a kind of a sun worship thing, always to do with sacrifices. And uh, what the Romans would do, would, what I believe, is they would take the fire, the, they'd have two fires. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the, the Romans or who came up with this, really, but they'd have two fires and they, they would drive the cattle through the middle um, to try and pass them through the fire. You've heard of that in the scriptures, although when he's talking about passing through the fire to Moloch, he's talking about sacrificing uh, that way, not necessarily passing through that. As they believe that if they pass the cattle through the fires, they would protect them for the following year. The men would do that with their sweethearts. They would pass through the smoke uh, to try and get good luck. And as the Romans came to occupy here in Britain, they brought with them these festivals. However, we already had a very similar festival called Beltane uh, in Scotland and Ireland. 
Uh, this is, is called. And this has kind of died out a lot, but Beltane, as with all the other pagan festivals, was abolished by the Puritans. Woohoo! You know, <laughs> good on them. But obviously, when they lost rule, it started to come back in when the Stuarts took back over. But um, the, this festival is believed to have started about April 28th and ends on May 2nd. And they brought these rituals of the Floralia festival and they were added to that of Beltane. So we have a mixture of Floralia and Beltane in there. And uh, I don't really know what they call it. Belta Floralia, I don't know, maybe. But uh, so they amalgamated these things into what we have as, as that today. Now, that's the basic uh, um, history behind it. But let's look at some of the things that are, are, are there. Now, the scripture did say that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And this must be our focus on how we worship Christ. A lot of people say, well, I'll worship him my way. No, you can't worship him your way because the scripture says we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right? So we must worship the way the spirit leads. Okay? So that's number one. We must worship the way the spirit leads. And number two, it must be done in truth. So if we say that we can worship Jesus by celebrating Easter, number one, is that how the spirit has led us? Because we know that Easter has so much pagan uh, rituals with it. I mean, more so than Christmas, really, uh, Ishtar is, when you see it. When you see the traditions of that, Easter Sunday specifically, sunrise services. You know, specifically having a sunrise service or baking hot cross buns to the Queen of Heaven is strictly forbidden by the prophet Ezekiel. I mean, the thing is, you know, there, there's nothing really in the scriptures that condemns the, work, the, the celebration of Christmas other than Jeremiah chapter 10 talking about the Christmas tree. You know, but people don't apply that. But the customs of, of Easter, a lot of them are outlined exactly in the scriptures. Uh, baking bread to the Queen of Heaven as the hot cross buns. Worshipping the rising sun on Easter Sunday. Uh, you know, just worshipping the Queen of Heaven in general. So, you know, we see these things are specific. And Jesus even said, you know, um, you know you've, you've done away with tradition, uh, you've done away with God's commandments. You can keep the traditions of men. You know, and he, he says in Hosea, I believe it is as well, Hosea chapter 5, he said, I hate, I despise your feasts. These things that you've done, I hate them. And this is just another one that uh, we, have, that we as, as um, Christians, or perhaps the Catholic Church more appropriately, have Christianized to try and cover up the pagan background. But is that the truth? No, it's not. It's covering up Satanism with a film of Christianity. Well, folks, anywhere you look at it, the devil is the father of what? Lies. So anytime we've got Satan and we cover it up, underneath, on the surface, we may see Jesus, but underneath we have lies. Right? So we cannot do that. We cannot just cover it up with that. Now, yes, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, but it doesn't cover it to where you take that off and it's there. It, it annihilates it, basically. It covers it so that it's not brought up by the devil again. But when you strip back these things, when you strip back the names, you see the paganism behind it. And that is not truth. And it's certainly not led of the Spirit. So in our worship, we must look and see, are we worshipping in spirit, number one, and in truth, number two? Those are the two things that we need to look at. Now, if we talk about the maypole, it doesn't take us very long to determine what that represents. Thank you, Jordan. I knew you would get it. All right, just waiting for that. Right? So, but it's always, always pick a teenager to figure these things out. Amen. Um, but uh, we don't take long to realize that the maypole is just another phallic symbol. You say, how do you know that? Because it's sticking straight up. And pretty much anything that is there that they stick in the ground, sticking straight up, is used to represent the phallus, whether it be an obelisk or some form of tower or this maypole. And the other thing, too, is with this maypole, is every village would have one. And they would go out into the forests, and they would cut down their tree, uh, and do what they were going to do, and bring it in. And the challenge was to see who had the biggest one. That was the, the, the great thing with every village, to see who had the biggest um, maypole. <laughs> you know, but that was the challenge of the pagans. This is what they would want to do. And... Uh, a lot of times they were just set up for the day 
And, um, but in things like London, the larger town or towns, they were put up permanently. Um, but of course the Puritans uh, did away with it, thankfully, but uh, the, um, obviously the return of the Stuarts, it reappeared and the festivities of May Day were once again brought back in. Now, things like the Reformation kind of hindered a lot of these pagan Catholic practices again. You know, you've got men speaking out against it even uh, later on in, the, in the, the, you know, the 18th and 20th century. You've got guys like Spurgeon that uh, were preaching against it, uh, preaching against these pagan traditions, uh, which is funny because so many Baptists today quote Spurgeon, but they don't quote him all the way. You know, they, they kind of leave out these quotes that he said against Christmas and against Easter and against any of these papal festivals. You know, when the Prince of Preachers, as they call them, you know, made a statement like that, it's worth taking notice of these things, that we need to study them out to see what, uh, what is, is, is there. And uh, with the Maypole, uh, they always they, they tended to dance around it. Uh, a lot of times they, they would um, call it different names. Uh, somewhere it was called the Tree of Liberty. And uh, what the, 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 the Catholics did was basically made it into some form of tree, supposing even that Jesus himself was crucified on a maypole, um, which is just absolutely ri ridiculous. Um, the young people what would, uh, would gather around it and dance underneath it, and they would have mock marriages. Even they'd have mock marriages, and then they would consummate these marriages uh, in adultery, and uh, call the, the children that were, were produced, uh, they were called them Mary Begats, because it was done from, from merriment as a result. And uh, they would just do this, this thing, which is, is ridiculous. So it's, it's a, a very uh, pagan, a very sexual um, festival, because it involved a lot of promiscuity, a lot of, of these things uh, in that way. And uh, that's uh, whether they still do that today, I don't know. But oftentimes these children that were born were not acknowledged by the fathers because it had been done in a mock marriage. So these children were actually termed and said to have been fathered by God, saying they had no father. And uh, that was the night before, uh, also April 30th, that night. And the next day they would, uh, they would dance around it, frolicking and do all these kind of things. But uh, one source believes that what the maypole also did was a viaduct to let demons that were in the earth escape through this thing. So they stuck it in there to let the demons come out that way. Now, one of the things that I discovered about it was the dancing uh, around it was often done with, um, with, with transvestite things, as men dressing as the, the women and women dressing as the men. And what I do see in today, if you think about it, is the way the Morris dancers, which is, is connected with this, really prance around like a bunch of fairies. I mean, they do. You know, they're waving their hankies and jumping around with bells and things like that on. And I mean, how is that manly? I've always thought to myself, how in, in this world is Morris dancing manly? I mean, even ballet dancing, I can say, is slightly manly because it takes a lot of strength to pick somebody up and, and to stand on your toes and things like that. So although it's a bit, you know, kind of, eh, but, you know, the, the, the great strength that is involved in ballet, it, it, you know, it's, it has to be, say, hey, you know, all, all credit to you. But Morris dancing, I mean, tying bells to your knees and shoes, dressing up like, uh, you know, you're, you're looking for your schnitzel and then taking hankies and parading around like this just does not scream manliness to me at all. And so I see that in the root of this transvestitism, if you like, that way that they're dressing up like that and the role reversal that these things. And uh, as I said, it's evidently a phallic symbol that these things have been set up. And, you know, the people dancing in, in and out to weave and to weave these uh, knots and these kind of things and all the, the stuff that goes on uh, around it. Now, a lot of times what they would do is this, uh, you know, like the, the, the cattle, they would have the bonfires the night before, drive the cattle through it, jump through the fires. In, in some places they would have a, a little bonfire and they would jump over it. And what they're trying to do is, is jump around. Uh, they were trying to teach the crops how high to grow. The higher they could jump, 
the higher the crops would grow. And uh, this is uh, another practice in witchcraft that the witches would, would get on the broomsticks and jump around the field um, to teach the crops how to grow and uh, believing that they could fly. That's why where the witches riding on broomsticks came from. But actually, it's they're just their, their thing to, to jump around uh, to try and pretend that, that make the crops grow up these things higher. But again, if we see, if we try and partake of these things, the, the scriptures tells us to learn not the way of the heathen. You know, Jeremiah 10 tells us not to not learn the way of the heathen. And we certainly, this, I mean, this is not something that's specifically um, reappropriated for Christ in the mainstream Christianity, but it certainly is in the Catholic Church and in other places in Europe. It has been changed to, to uh, saints' days and these kind of things to try and uh, make the most of these pagan things. Now, if we're gonna if we're gonna do that, we need to just put it to one side and say, okay, this is not of God. Let's put it over here. This is of God. Let's do this. Not try and amalgamate the two and uh, work these things out. But all the pagan um, the things have a, 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 a purpose. They're all calculated very specifically throughout the year. You know, you've got ones, um, that are, I can't remember what they call it, a cross um, something. But anyway, you have, you have like, uh, uh, this, is, this is a high Sabbath for the, the, the pagans, the witches. And the other one, uh, the, the other side of the year will be Halloween. You, then you've got the solstices as well. You've got the summer solstice, the winter solstice, you've got the equinoxes, you've got things like um, 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 uh, um, February 2nd, um, oh, I forget what it's called, Imbolc or something like that, I think it's called, and uh, Lunas, Luna, the, the other one at that end. But they're all kind of halfway this way, all these things. They're, they're not like God who has set them out specific dates through the year for a specific purpose to show us uh, these things. You know, um, for example, like the, the Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits are all within a very short period of time. Well, they were all fulfilled in a very short period of time with Jesus dying on, on Passover, uh, buried for unleavened bread and rising for first fruits, all fulfilled with a very short period of time. Then you have Pentecost, which is, is right in the middle of seven weeks after uh, first fruits. But then you have another while until you get to trumpets. And then trumpets in Yom Kippur and tabernacles are again within basically the same the, a little a little piece a little short piece of time. Why? Because again, these ones, the latter ones, are going to be fulfilled very quickly when we've got the rapture, the second coming, and uh, the millennial kingdom uh, to come, and then obviously the new heaven and the new earth a thousand years later. But those are all fulfilled in a very short period of time, you know, in the grand scale of things. So what we're doing today is we're living basically in the, in the time of, of Pentecost, if you like, where the Spirit has been poured out. And this is the extended time. So we have that short fulfillment, this extended fulfillment of Pentecost being fulfilled. It hasn't been fulfilled. It is being fulfilled because the Holy Spirit is still available. Amen. The Holy Spirit is still being poured out upon us. We still uh, can have the, the full fulfillment, uh, the, full, the, the filling, the, the fullness of the Spirit uh, today. And of course, when the rapture takes place, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will be gone with, with us. So that will make, mark the end of Pentecost to bring the beginning of trumpets. So when trumpets comes in, marks the end of Pentecost there in the fulfillment. And you can see that in, 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 in Revelation as well, the church age and, then, and these kind of things, or church time, but I shouldn't say age. Or, uh, well, yeah, age is an okay word to use. Anyway, um, <clears throat> A lot of times the, the farmers and things would, would do these uh, things with the, 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 how they would take the cows and, and take blood off of them, let the blood dry, burn, burn the blood, put the blood on the things and, and do these kind of things and, and have fairy trees as well and then leave milk and food under these fairy trees for the, you know, to ward off these demons. Um, other things that they would do is the farmers would lead a procession around the boundaries of their farm to bring protection. And I thought this was very interesting because this week, I believe, is the very start of where people will be riding around boundaries uh, for the coming week. Am I right? It's this week it starts? Yeah. Okay. Right? Starting over there with Hoyt and then moving throughout the borders and these things. I thought it was very interesting that this is the week that it's starting 
you know, showing that, that these people are going to be riding around these boundaries uh, doing these kind of things. I thought, hmm, I wonder if that's a lot to do with it. I know a lot of the things that they have with the local festivals are, f are definitely Masonic. Um, certainly the symbolists and all this, especially here in this town, when we see you've got the main man who's basically God for a year. He can do no wrong. And everybody cheers. Woo! Yay! Yay! You know, and everybody shouts, hip, hip, hooray. Remember what hip, hip, hooray means? Jerusalem has fallen. Jerusalem has fallen. We're going to paradise. It comes from a Turkish phrase, which means that. So anytime we say hip, hip, hooray, so when we, the, the people sit, so the guys riding through there, hip, 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 you know, we're like, hooray. And so basically they're saying, Jerusalem has fallen. We're like, yeah, we're off to paradise. No, it's an old, from an old Turkish phrase. So, you know, a lot of things we say, we don't even know what they're talking about. You know, so we, we, this guy rides through and he shouts hip, hip, and we say hooray, and everybody cheers, and, and everybody, people don't even know this guy. They don't even know him. Half the folks in the town, especially the people that come in from this, like, who's that guy? Well, I don't know. But he's calling for the year. What? You know, that's basically the way it is. You know, you don't know who he is, but obviously he's somebody now. But, uh, you know, try going to Edinburgh and seeing that, and you see, well, I was Jather Callan. Uh, and? You know, <laughs> you know, or going up to Aberdeen and telling them you're the white cornet. Do you get a pill for that? Or, you know, <laughs> you know, is, it, is it contagious? You know, <laughs> is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> you know, it, it, it really, um, it's, you know, when we see that, and we see um, his left hand, his right hand man, and, and being preceded by a herald, uh, to me it's, it's nothing more than a mockery of Christ, uh, having this herald going before blowing a trumpet, uh, to, to usher in this man riding on horseback as he marches into the town with his two right-hand men and his legion of followers behind him. You know, it just it screams to me just a mockery of, of, of that. And, oh, and of course, he cannot be uh, elected to that position unless he joins the Masonic Lodge. So that in itself tells you that all the things that are going to have to be uh, done with that. But I thought that was interesting that this is the time when they would ride around the boundaries to protect the farm. But this is the very week that that is going to start, not necessarily riding around the farm, but riding around the boundaries of these various towns. And uh, the procession generally stopped at the four points of the compass, um, beginning at the east, and uh, rituals done at each of the four, uh, four points. Now, it would be interesting to look at the rideouts and see which directions they go. Because I do know that some of them go that way, some of them go that way, some of them go that way, and some of them go that way. So it would be interesting to see. And it's, you know, they go out to certain places where they believe battles were done. And there's always some sort of ritual done at those places. So it's very interesting to see that this is the time of year. And possibly that uh, May Day and Beltane have not really died out, but they've just transitioned in the borders into the local festivals as, as they were. Now, of course, being it was Floralia, there's a lot of flowers and lots of decorations and things pinned up around the houses, uh, bushes uh, that they would put together with flowers, ribbons, garlands, and, and uh, colored eggshells. I wonder where they got those from, uh, you know, uh, put together. And those bushes, uh, decorations, then used to light the bonfires. And a lot of people would um, put out their own fire and then restart it with the fire from the Beltane the Beltane bonfire. Of course, bonfire, as we know, is, comes from bone fire, so it's a, a sacrificial uh, fire as well. The Catholic Church decided that they would take May Day and call an add an R to it and call it Mary's Day. So again, they're worshipping the, the god of Flora, but since it's a female god, it's obviously tracing back to Samaramus, to Ishtar, Diana, who, or Astarte, or whoever else you wanted. And of course, the Catholics like to call her Mary, uh, the Queen of Heaven, and they've applied that to her. But Mary is never called a queen in the scriptures. The Queen of Heaven is a pagan deity that, the, that they sacrifice to. But they have called it Mary's Day, and it was sanctioned that. But also, what is interesting is in our history, we find there's a lot of laws passed on the 1st of May. The Act of the Union was passed on the 1st of May. Right? Uh, what else was it? Um, uh, the slave trade, the prohibition of the slave trade, was, uh, was done 100 years later. And there's, there's been many, many laws have been into effect on the 1st of May. 
because this was believed by the ancient Celts to be the first day of summer, uh, the, the solstice being midsummer, uh, is what they, they thought about it. So again, we've seen that. But in Robin um, influence, the Queen of Heaven was called Maid, Marianne. So it's, uh, and Marianne coming from the Latin uh, Mar or Mare for, anybody know? La Mare? Sea, exactly. Sea. So it's Maid, Marian, but then it became, that's when it became uh, Mare, and it was reversed to Mermaid. So queen of the sea. So the mermaid is actually the god of the sea. So Maid Marianne is, the, is another form of mermaid. Uh, mermaid, sea maid, sea maiden, sea goddess, and this kind of thing. So that's, again, where we've come this from. If you think about Dagon as the fish god, he's half man, half fish. It makes sense that they made the, 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 the sea goddess half woman, half, uh, half fish. You know, I always thought it'd be funny if they put it back to front. Where it had legs with a fish, you know, just with a fish head. I thought that would be really kind of funny, but apparently the pagans didn't, didn't you know. I think they voted and they were like, no, 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 we'll go with the, we'll go with the, the human body and the, and the fish tail. We'll go with that, yeah, for Dagon. But then we as Christians take that same symbol, the fish, and we slap it on our bumper stickers and things of, hey, we're Christians, look. Why? Because we've got Dagon symbol on our bumper. Good for you, yeah. A little bit of education goes a long way. But uh, what is, is, is slays me is we've got all these Christian bookshops selling these, oh, this is the fish symbol. This is what the, the ancient Christians used to, to tell them apart. What, they didn't have the Holy Spirit to bear witness? Yeah, because the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit. The Spirit beareth witness with our spirit, that we're children of God. And when you meet somebody that's a Christian, the Spirit beareth witness in that. Do we need symbols? Where in the scriptures did God say that we need a symbol to tell that we're a Christian? I actually find the opposite. God says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. You know, so God is not one for symbols. God does not want symbols. Just because you wear a cross around your neck and have a fish on your bumper sticker doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. It actually means that you're very uneducated and ignorant of the things of the scriptures that tell us that these things have come from paganism. And these as markers, as symbols, are definitely of that. Now, I must say that the preaching of the cross is something entirely different than the worship of the cross. Those two things should not be mixed up. We really have to see that as true. But when we try to define ourselves by a symbol, we're saying, what? Why do we need a symbol to define ourselves? Should not our testimony, should not the Holy Spirit, should not our speech, our conduct speak for us? You know, uh, Mrs. Mathis told us of someone today who had spoken to somebody else and, 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 and they figured that this fellow was claiming to be a Christian. And he said, are they Christian? And Mrs. Mathis said, probably not. And he said, I didn't figure they were. But he knew by our testimony that we most definitely are Christians. But he knew instantly from meeting this fellow only once or twice that this guy was probably not a Christian. It was very interesting. And I don't know whether the fellow that Mrs. Mathis uh, was talking to is saved or not. He, he said he lost his faith, but there's certainly something there. There's something there, whether he, you know, and a lot of that happens to a lot of soldiers. It really does. That they kind of, if they've never been taught, even, even people that have gone off to university, that are sound Christians, but they've never been taught how to refute evolution or taught how to refute these things, they come away and they, then they get brainwashed, if you like, into the evolutionary way of thinking and leave uh, the church. Even though they may be saved, they have come away from it because of why? Of lack of education. Because we have not trained up our children so that when they're old, they'll not depart from it. That is the key. Is, uh, you know, if we train up our children the way we'll go, that when they're old, they'll not depart from it. But the opposite is true. When we don't train them up in that way, then the chances are that they will depart from it. You know, we, we purposely talk about that training up our children. But if we don't, the opposite is true. And that's why it's important to teach our children these things. That's why God said to, to teach them the commandments, to train them up, to, to tell them these things and, 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 and talk of these things. And of course, we have this with, with Maid Marian. Uh, and of course, we, we know if you think about the story that involves Maid Marian, 
has been glorified with Robin Hood. Exactly. Uh, he's, he's, he's a thief. He's a thief. He's a low-down, dirty thief. And uh, what does he do? He robs from the rich to give to the poor. Oh, what a noble cause that is. No, that's socialism. That's distributing the wealth. That's all right. Well, we'll tax these people that work really hard for the money. Well, we'll tax these people and we'll give it to the ones on welfare. Okay, you bum there. You're lazy. You're not doing anything, right? You're working all your days. You've started up a business. That's fantastic. We're going to tax you 50%. So this guy that's never worked a day in his life can get the money as well. We're going to share the wealth. That's what Robin Hood is all about. You know, it's probably Barack Obama's favorite story. <laughs> but you see socialism coming in. That's a, a part of the SMP as well. And more, more, more benefits for people that don't want to work. Now, I understand that people, like, you know, that, that are out of work at present. I get that. That's fair enough. I get that. I was there myself. And I'm glad that we have a system that if we are fall on hard times or we cannot work, like Brother Roney, you know, with sickness and stuff, that we're there, as we should, according to the scriptures, take care of those that cannot work or those that are not able to work uh, or those that are old or, or whatever and, and help out those that cannot work. But I remember sitting in, in one of the classrooms when I, had, I was made to go on one of these courses. I said, I don't need a course. I'm quite qual qualified. I just need a job. You said, well, you have to go on this course and you have to apply for five jobs every day. I said, there's no five jobs I can do. You know, and they said, well, what, what do you think about this? And there was some kind of, um, you know, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was some kind of factory job. It was like a managing director of some kind of factory that I had, that I had no idea of anything about. I said, why would I apply for that? Well, it's a job. I said, but I don't know the first thing about that production. Well, but you need to apply. Well, I said, I said, but think of it from the other side. I said, you've got this guy sitting there, uh, managing director, you know, a, a position applied for, managing director of a chemical factory. Greatest came, cl claim to fame. I was the white cornet. But you think about how many of those he has to go through every day. But anyway, that's beside the, beside the point. You know, socialism is, is that is what's coming in. And this festival is all about that, is really doing that in this socialistic way of thinking. And, of course, Maid Marian comes into Robin Hood and uh, the Merry Men. Well, Mary is, is a derivative of mer, uh, from the Latin uh, mer, of which we translate it. La Mer is French for the sea. Uh, de la Mar is, is, uh, is Spanish in that way. And we see where that's coming to it. And, um, uh, and uh, is it Mar de la Mar? I don't remember. Uh, M-E-R, I think it is. Um, but, uh, but we see that the Mary comes from the sea in that way. So the Mary men, so you get Maid Marian, the sea goddess, and her mariners, her Mary, her, her sea men in that way. So again, this is what we got. And, and then, of course, Robin Hood, the thief, gets to, to go off with, the, with, with this woman uh, in that way. So again, it's just the worship of the sea goddess and uh, again the worship of Maya a Greek fertility goddess so um, again all these things come together um, to do uh, that and excuse me and it's, it's, it's supposed that the cavorting and the sexual games that are played on this day are actually called the Robin Hood games by a lot of pagans I don't know if that's true but that's what some sources have told me but again we divide up the year into all these things and this is a high day something that we should be aware of uh, because if we're not aware aware of it we like like the putting our fishes on our car or or celebrating easter and christmas and these kind of things we get lumped into that because we don't know the scriptures or we don't know the history behind these things because we have never studied them out for ourselves and so we can go along in ignorance and we can stand before god and we can say well, I didn't know. You know, try, try, try going down through Jedra at 80 miles an hour past the police van and tell them that you didn't know it was a 30 mile an hour li limit. See how you get on. Yeah? 
Next time you get pulled over for speeding, tell them you didn't know. Or if you're driving dangerously, just say, well, I don't really know how to drive. <laughs> and they'll say to you, have you ever read the highway code? Oh, yeah, I read it once from my test, but then I put it away. It's going to be the same thing with the Bible. God's going to say, you know, you're going to say, well, I didn't know. God's going to say, didn't you read my Bible? Well, yeah, I read it a couple of times, but then I put it away. You know, there's no excuse, um, you know, for the laws of the land or for God's laws. And again, we must wait up by spirit and in truth. The spirit will tell us whether something, even if we don't recognize the actual physical pagan roots, the spirit will well up in us to say no you know but the tendency is we have to fight against the spirit because our conscience becomes seared like a hot iron and for many baptists especially today a lot of these things are dyed in the wool baptist festivals but they're not they've only been baptist for just over about 150 years not even 150 years the first christmas service in a baptist church was in the united states and it was in 1870 so it's not dyed in the wool Baptist things. They're dyed in the wool Catholic festivals, absolutely. But they are not Baptist festivals. They have progressively come in from Protestant churches and we have adopted them. So again, this is another one that we need to be aware of. Another thing to pray against, uh, to be praying against those spirits of that, that we protect ourselves uh, from, these, from these things and to, um, and to be wary of uh, these things that, at the year. I believe the next thing coming up will be the, the summer uh, solstice. Let me just have a, a quick look. Um, yep, yeah, we've got midsummer, what they call it. So uh, basically the, the, they have, uh, so we, today is like Beltane, and then between the 19th and the 23rd of June will be midsummer. And on the 1st of August is Lunasa, uh, again, uh, across the section one. And then the 21st to the 24th of September is Maybon, another pagan festival. Uh, 30th, 31st of uh, October, the 1st of November, Shavain, uh, Halloween. Then Yule, Christmas, uh, Imbolc on the 2nd of February, uh, Ostara, which is Easter, uh, usually around the 19th to 22nd of March, and then back to, to Beltane again. So but each one of these is specifically calculated and they're polar opposites, six months, six months apart on the pagan wheel calendar. You just Google that, the, pay, the um, wheel of the year, I believe it's what it's called, and it'll come up with all the information and you can Google these feasts or these um, pa pagan Sabbaths. And we need to realize that, that although not all of them have been brought into you know, our way of worship, if you like, certainly things like Easter and Christmas, and you know, sadly now Halloween has been brought into by a lot of Baptist churches, having trunk or treat where they try to get out and they dress up and they do all these things. But again, that's not truth. That's covering lies with truth. And that's not true. Uh, the, yes, the Bible says overcome evil with good, but, but the scriptures tell us, us to put away those things, you know, and establish what God has already established. God has told us how he wants to be worshipped. And he's given us in his scriptures how he, wants, how he wants us to be done and what he wants us to celebrate. Not to add on the traditions of men, as Jesus told them that they had, that they had added in these things. But we have added in celebrate the birth of Christ, which has never, never been commanded in the scriptures. His birth was celebrated. Yes, the angel sang when he was born. The shepherds came. The, the wise men did not come to the birth. They came later on when he was about two years old. You know, at the very least 18 months you know that was never told but what was told was to, to remember his death is to remember his death on the day he died that's when what God tells us to do but yet it, you know it, with the taking of the Lord's Supper that's what Jesus did but on the day of the Passover he takes the Passover and he shows them that hey I am the Passover Jesus is saying and he shows them the Lord's Supper so in, showing the transition from Passover, he says, you don't need to kill a lamb anymore. I'm the lamb. But you will take the unleavened bread and you will take the fruit of the vine because if we use loaf bread or Ribena or alcoholic wine, we are saying that there is sin in the body of Christ. And if we are partaking in that, we are in eating and drinking damnation to ourselves. 
The Bible is specific. Unleavened bread, Jesus said, and fruit of the vine. If there is any, any sugar, yeast, or any of these things in that communion, um, wine, whatever you want to call it, then it is not a representation of the blood of Christ. It is polluted. It has got leaven in it. And God says, you shall not offer the sacrifice with leaven. So if we have to take in communion with um, bread with yeast in it, for it is risen, or we're taking it with actual wine, it's been fermented, it's been leavened. It is therefore we are eating, saying that there's sin in the blood and body of Christ. Plus, if we're taking it any time of the year, we're saying it doesn't matter when we take it. You know, we're just, it's pastor's discretion because everyone said, oh, oh, well, you know, as often as you do it, as often as you do that, that's what it means. All that means is whenever. But Jesus outlined to do it. You go all the way back to Genesis 15 with, um, with um, Melchizedek and Abram. 14th day of the first month. Moses was told the 14th day of the first month. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper the 14th day of the first month. He died the 14th day of the first month. And if we're doing it in remembrance, we should be doing it the 14th day of the first month. And no other time. Did, Jesus didn't die on the 3rd of June. You know, he died the 14th day of the first Hebraic month. You know, and uh, but pastors today reckon that they can just, yeah, we'll set up communion. Hey, let's have communion. You know, let's do this whenever we want to. Folks, that's not in the scriptures. That's not what God said. God clearly shows us that that's the day to do it. And uh, God is specific that we worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do come to you tonight in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your goodness, for your blessings, and for all that you've done. We thank you for showing us these things, and thank you we can look into this and know the scriptures, and thank you for revealing all this truth to us. We pray that you bless those that are here, bless those that are watching, and pray that this would be a help to someone uh, in some way. We thank you, Lord. We do love you, and we pray that you be with us and bless us as we travel our separate ways today. In Jesus' most precious name, bless it. Amen. 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 Amen.